Ducharme, and I come from the next state over in Connecticut. I'm uh, located in Manchester, Connecticut, where my, with regard to my workplace, and I live in a place called Granby, Connecticut, which is on the Massachusetts uh, Connecticut border. My time, the hour or so that I will spend with you, it's going to be um, taken up with discussion of something called circles of support. Uh, what they are, what they're not, um, and how it is that they have affected my life, personally, and how they have affected the life of a number of people with disabilities that we've had the uh, pleasure of of interacting with uh, over the last few years. And I guess that I'd like to begin my remarks by, by sort of taking right off from where David uh, began. My journey with people with disabilities began in 1964 when I uh, lived in Willimantic, Connecticut. Some of you may know Willimantic, uh, not too far away. You do, okay, George. Um, Willimantic, Connecticut is located about 12 or 15 miles uh, down the street from Mansfield Training School, uh, what used to be Mansfield Training School, as of this summer it no longer exists as an entity. And my education about people with disabilities, similar to what David experienced, was not at all connected with knowing a person with a disability in any of my educational experience, knowing in my family, a uh, pretty large French-Canadian family and a smaller Sicilian family. My mom's Sicilian and my uh, dad's French-Canadian. That causes some interesting <laughs> combinations of uh, problems here. But um, no one in the family, immediate family, had a disability that we could figure out. Uh, but up the road from us, everyone knew that Mansfield Training School was there. As a freshman in high school, that was the first contact, literally, that I had with people up at Mansfield Training School because uh, at the time, Mansfield had the equivalent of a professional football team, 1960, 61. Um, there were people living there that had lived there for a long time. They had not the, the label, really, of mental retardation, but somehow or other they were there. Uh, they had been playing football together for about uh, seven or eight years. And the freshman team of the, of the Wyndham High School football team would play Mansfield Training School. I think that was some humorous way for our coaches to toughen us up a little bit. Yeah. But that was our image. It was a tough image. In 1964, after I had graduated from school and was in college, I decided that I would want to uh, experience summer work up there and began as a summer worker at Mansfield Training School. And to make a long story short, continued my, my interaction with people with disabilities, finally entered the field after, while studying for a master's degree uh, at, with the Department of Mental Retardation in Connecticut in 1968 and worked for the department until 1985. Many positions in the central office and ending up being a regional director for what was then known as the Tolland region uh, of Eastern, central, Eastern Connecticut from 1977 to 1985. And then in 1985, uh, something happened. Um, actually, it was beginning to happen in 82, 83, 84. I was beginning to become aware that for all of my efforts, all of which was in the development of community services. I was a community services director in the central office for a number of years. Was trying to create that series of possibilities. Enough money, enough staff, enough interaction within agencies in the community, enough private communities to create community services that would be sufficient enough to serve children, young adults and adults with mental retardation primarily within the context of the community. And we never were able to reach that point of enough staff, enough money to do that 
1985, when I had become a regional director and had done everything I could do to multiply resources in that context, I suddenly came to the conclusion that we never would have enough money and enough resources to create community service. And it suddenly struck me, I had been doing some reading and some thinking, that what we needed to do, as David pointed out in his illustration, is not work on the side of trying to create enough community services, but work on the side of inclusion, didn't know the term at that time, inclusion within the context of community. And of course, John McGow's tape uh, illustrates that magnificently. Not everybody has all the talents and all the possibilities of John McGow, however. And what we needed to do was to find out how it worked for everybody <coughs> to come in contact. The other thing that struck me is that I had been working in large numbers. 10,000 people on the case road in Connecticut, 2,000 people in my region, all large numbers, uh, and felt powerless in the midst of those numbers. And suddenly it struck me as I was uh, reading again and interacting with some folks that we really needed to start one at a time, one at a time, and see what, what could happen. Well, about that time when I had uh, decided to leave state service and begin on my own little consulting business and see about any of these ideas working, uh, I met David up in Holyoke, Massachusetts, and shortly after him, John McKnight. Had the opportunity to invite them by way of a developmental disabilities grant uh, into Connecticut in 1986, along with a young lady named Beth Mount, who has been here, I believe, on a few occasions. So John McKnight, David Weathero, and Beth Mount came for something that I had been thinking about for a number of years <coughs> and had the opportunity to put into practice to develop a conference which we call Beyond Community Services toward full community inclusion. And that began a journey for me that brings me to this opportunity to, to share a few ideas and thoughts with you. Uh, that particular conference <coughs> and those same slides of Amber seven years ago, sorry, that's, uh, <laughs> hang on. Uh, those same slides of Amber seven years ago, just coming out of the institution, so affected people within the Developmental Disabilities Council and the gathered folks there, particularly one lady named Kathy Ludlow, that we have devoted everything that we've done and everything that we've had to share to trying to convey notions of what we think about as circles of support. Now, the term circles of support did not come from us. That came from Judith Snow and uh, Marsha Forrest and folks up in Toronto. Uh, we've been able to adapt uh, that, their particular uh, living story and journey to what we're doing in Connecticut. We've had the opportunity to put a few of these into booklet form, and the last thing that we've had the opportunity to do was to help David uh, develop another dream into reality and, and helped him uh, produce the whole community catalog, which you'll see very much. Why do I do all of this journey for you, <laughs> spend a good deal of time telling you this? I think that many of you share the same journey that I share. Many of you are probably in the same places, whether you are working for government or working for agencies and such. And to know that this is, that, that you struggle with or that I have struggled with, how it is that I live in the context of where I am and still work one-on-one. -on -one. Um, let me share a few ideas, if I can, with you. Things we've learned from Kathy Ludlam and a lot of other people with disabilities that we've had the pleasure of walking with. And I want to share this term with you. It's had a big impact upon me and what I do now. I have the pleasure, as I've talked to Bill over there, I have the pleasure of now being on the faculty at Manchester Community College in Manchester, Connecticut. Um, and trying to interact with the faculty and the staff there and the students and how it is to portray welcoming of people with disabilities. The campus at Manchester is very welcoming. There are lots of students there with disabilities that I had nothing to do, to do about. Uh, helping the campus to see 
and helping all students within the campus to see why it's important for people to be among them and to be equal to, to us and to begin to know how to live one with the other is a, is a great pleasure that I have right now on the faculty of Manchester Community College. We um, tried to articulate what it is we were learning from Kathy, from Todd, from Kevin, from Regina, from a number of people whose stories you'll find in the whole community catalog and other of our journeys. And I'm going to focus, however, on Kathy, if I may. Kathy is a young lady that has severe physical disabilities. Uh, she came to the conference in 1986 as a scribe assigned by her boss in the protection and advocacy system. Uh, she is, I would encourage you, if you want to continue to learn more about this work and what I'm about to say and what we have to say, to invite her. She lives in Manchester, Connecticut. She speaks all over uh, the eastern part of the country and up into Canada as well. Magnificent spokesperson for herself and what's happening in her life. But we met her at this conference, and as she tells her story, she was very reluctant to come mainly because for six years prior to our conference, from her effectively her junior year in high school through her senior year in college, she had looked all over North America, literally, for a place that she could live after her mom died. Now, her mom was, until this February, her only source of support, physical support, and Kathy needs total total support physically. Her mom was her only source of support. And she knew that when her mom died, she needed to find another place to live. And as she put it, this place needed to be both safe and free. And as her six-year self-study evolved, she could find places that were safe, but not free. Or free but not safe, as she had described. To find something with both qualities was something that nobody, uh, and she's a very bright young lady and very persistent. She, she talked to a lot of people. She would even create her own place, move to any place that there was where she could be both safe and free and couldn't find her. She was told that she was so disabled because of her particular physical disabilities that she needed to go into a nursing home after her mom died. So she gave up, as she put it, and decided not to think about the future anymore. Until David came along and showed some slides, a couple of slides that he didn't show here. He had the illustration up on the board. Slides of Catherine Schaefer, a person with more disabilities <coughs> than, Kat, than Kathy Ludlam had, who currently lived in something that was called a co-op. And I remember the evaluation form from that particular day that Kathy sent in. We didn't know Kathy. She had it in about three inch letters on her paper. It said, if anything like this starts in Connecticut, call me. And uh, we had the opportunity after the conferences were over, this actually was in October of 1986 that you came to see us. By December, the DD Council had said, let's try some of this stuff and see if it works, and gave us a small grant to begin work with five people, and we call Kathy. And the way we do our thing, and I'm going to pop down here. I hope, I hope we can still communicate with one another. After a couple of years, we, we began to, we called what we, we called what we had learned up to that point, something called one candle power. And we didn't do that to be cute. We wanted to discover something that was an image that anyone could understand that spoke to what we were learning, at least, of how to start small, how to start with the least amount of, of energy that you could possibly imagine. And the energy source of one candle is not about to power an awful lot of things by itself. But what we began to discover when we took 
a little bit of what Marcia Forrest and Judith Snow and David Weatherow and John McKnight and other people whom we were being introduced to had to say, it began to become clear to us that we could do what we had to do one person at a time and we could start with the smallest gift that anyone could, could imagine. So the candle for us stands for the fact that each of us has a gift to give. No matter what we're labeled, no matter if we're labeled severe with a severe disability or we're labeled with a Harvard degree, it doesn't matter to us. We, ha we each have a gift and when we enter a room, we don't care what the labels are. We just care to find out the gift. So one of the key areas is finding capacities. Um, that, that image is something that John McKnight shared with us. Many, many of you, I'm sure, have seen this. It's the image of a glass that's filled. And you can either decide that it's half empty or half full. And if you take the half empty part and focus on that, that's what we tend to do, unfortunately, in our field. Many times we have to do needs assessments. So we can label and call Kathy by a list of disabilities and emptiness, if you will, that, as David said, would be as long as your arm. Or we could focus on Kathy with what her capacities are. We find the fullness in her. And we decided that this method must not deny the disability, that, that we cannot and do not and will not do that. There's no denying the disabilities that Kathy has or that Todd has, et cetera, et cetera. You don't deny that. You're clear. We just don't focus on it. And Kathy herself was the, was the most intense spokesperson for what she needed to take care of these limitations. When we interact with people with other labels, we can share more information if we have time for questions. But for Kathy, her disabilities were very clear. I'll share that with you in a moment. What we learned as we were going on with trying to, to do what we call building bridges into community life for people with disabilities is we needed to focus on capacities and find out what those were. We needed to somehow plan a future. This is Beth Mount's gift to us. Many of you know about personal futures planning and that sort of thing. And we, we, we adopted that. We felt very, very positive about that because that used, used capacities and put it in a different context for us. So plan some sort of a future, short term, long term, doesn't matter. What is your dream? What is your vision for the future, if you have one? If you don't, let's talk about that <laughs> and see what we can do about tomorrow, next week, two months from now, possibly a few years from now. Kathy was clear. She had been working on this for six years. She's someone that was, was clear about her future. She didn't know what to call it, though. But she wanted some place other than a nursing home safe and free. Building circles, that's where the circle of support piece comes in. Uh, circles of support we learned, and we learned from, Kat, from uh, Beth Mount particularly, can't operate in a vacuum. These are groups of individuals who come together because they care about a person. That's the only criterion. It's not, it's not a substitute. We've had people take circles of support and substitute them for in, in, individual education teams or individual, all these IE this or IH that or you know, all this stuff. That's not what a circle of support is. A circle of support can, so, can complement, can assist, but to turn the IHP or the, the, the individual habilitation group or something into a circle of support, to call it that, is, is not doing justice to the circle of support. The circle of support, as we understand it, as it's being played out in a number of places, is a group of people, maybe two, because a person doesn't know a lot of people, maybe 25, we've had experiences of more, who come together for only one reason, because they care about Kathy. And the way they come together is that Kathy knows they care about her. She invites. The family invites, if it's a person, a younger child, or a person that can't quite 
talk for themselves yet. But the, the, the key ingredient is people come together because the person calling them knows they care for her in some way, not because they have degrees or certain expertise. Those are all very important. David was very clear, and I want to reemphasize the fact that when we speak about circles of support or natural supports or all of this stuff, we're not saying this versus competent professionals. We're not saying that. I need a good dentist from time. I want that person to be competent when I need them. Or I need, may need a good psychiatrist, and I want that person to be competent when I need them. But the key difference here is that I control that. So what we're saying in, in our approaches here, and we want to be very clear because we've been accused of being anti-agency, anti-professional, you know, that's not the point. I am professional myself. The point is, who's in control? Who, who's in control? And the more we can figure out to put the control into the hands of the person with a disability or the family, I think the closer we'll be getting to bringing community and people with disabilities together and not be the barrier in between that as professionals. Building circles, getting groups of people together, building bridges, another sort of catchword that we've got to be careful about. But what that means is assisting the individual with a disability to become more present into the context of community. John McGow, I don't know how, I couldn't put it all in the context of a videotape, but somehow or other, he, through his family, through his mom, through people they met, began to meet people like his friend the drummer, like the art teacher, like the hairdresser, and apparently they belong to the Presbyterian Church, I don't know. The point is, it's a natural interaction. And what our job as professionals is, and what our job as just friends and neighbors and parents and folks is, is to see if we could recognize certain gifts and capacities, someone recognized some things in John, and see if we can bridge the gap between this desire to do something and somebody in the community that has that same ability or that same desire. Uh, a friend of ours named Kevin Meadows, young man who's now 22 years of age, um, in the, with a variety of disabilities, one of which is uh, cerebral palsy. He has this big chair and has difficulty using his hands. But somehow or other, he demonstrated an ability with computers. And somebody picked up on that and drew that out a little bit in school and defended the, the, the possibility of getting a big Macintosh computer where you could do graphic arts and learn some things. Well, we were trying to figure out how it is after school, he was about to graduate, he could get into some associations or organizations in his small town. And somebody in the group said, how about this thing called Mac Users Clubs? I, I hear there's these things around, those people that are nuts about Macintosh computers and they gather together from time to time. And I guess they're the same thing with a variety of other computers and stuff. Well, none of us knew anything about that, so somebody took on the task of finding out if there was one around, found out that there was one in East Hartford, not too far away. Uh, someone else decided to call and see what the deal was, whether a guy like Kevin could come. And the thing that we began to learn, and we found this over and over again, we could share stories, you know, till, <laughs> till tomorrow evening if you want, about how it is that when you connect people who have similar interests, particularly if they're fanatics about this interest, this is, this is the best, is that people don't care about what your job is, what your title is, what you can, what, whether you're in a wheelchair, whether you're not in a wheelchair, etc. The only thing that matters is that you're nuts about Macintosh computers. And having one of the best Macintosh computers in the club doesn't hurt either <laughs> for Kevin. The other, and so someone made a connection, and the guy that answered the phone was welcoming. It could have been just the opposite, I suppose, but the guy was welcoming. And he said, gee, yeah, come on down. Um, but there's a problem. We meet on the second floor of such and such a building uh, every second Tuesday of the month. But let me, so this month probably won't be possible. But let me go and check with the 
guy who rents us the space or gives us the space, and we'll see if we can get down to the first floor. We've been wanting to do this for a long time anyhow. So now he had a reason for going to the owner and say, look, a member can't come in. You know, he's in a wheelchair, it's a all that sort of stuff. So Kevin was already a welcomed member because he caused the whole, the whole little club to go to the first floor where they wanted to be anyhow. And he's been going for what, about two, three years now. That's bridge building. That's listening to and seeing and understanding the capacity of Kevin, figuring out how it is that could that could be activated within the context of community. That is an, an actual community group that could get to know Kevin and he could get to know them, etc. Things happen when that happens. This may have been the way John McGowan met some of his other friends. But Kevin and Kevin's mom needed a doctor, a particular type of doctor, if someone had moved away. And just in brief conversation, really, you know, before or during the meeting, they had mentioned this. It turns out that one of the members of the Mac Users Club is, in fact, a doctor of that particular, you know, type. And you know, it seems like, oh, this is really, you know, wonderful story, and wouldn't happen here. Right? It don't happen any place. It happens with you and I. If we examine the way we have made our friends and relationships, and have met our, you know, our wives or husbands and good friends, etc., it has been because we've been in a context where, where similarity is scattered, whether it was in high school, maybe we have one or two good friends from high school, whether it was on a football team in high school, whether it was in the church choir, the knitting club, the quilting group, the, whatever. <laughs> whatever you're in, mean, if I went through, and one of the richest things that we do, maybe we can do this tomorrow in a smaller group, is when we go around and say, okay, take your professional hats off if you're a professional, and tell me what you really love to do. What do you do? You know, do you walk? Do you hike? Do you read? Do you play bridge? Do you do art? Do you play flute in the local band? What do you do? And when we went through, we would have gone through this whole group, the variety would have been so rich among you, and always what happens, someone in the front row here says they play flute in the band, someone back there says, geez, I play this and that, can we get, you know, and they get together and relationships build. And the only way relationships build naturally is when people get together. Not with a plan that says by three months, Kevin must be in a Mac users club, because, you know? It doesn't happen. Do you think that John McGow had a plan for doing what he did? Someone wrote that down and said, we're a failure if in six months we don't get him to do his art. It happens. And what we need to do is put people in the context of community, and that's the building bridges. Two other things we learned that we wanted to put, that we had to put in what we consider sort of the outline of what it is that, that happens when we interact with people, is we can't be afraid to start small. My job was always big, and I worked at getting bigger. I got my PhD, I went to the central office, I, I fought for the job of director of community services. I wanted to be a regional director because I thought if I did, and I wanted a big budget. <laughs> and I thought that if I got bigger, then somehow or other I'd be able to do more in community. I always kind of waited until I got big enough. It won't happen. <laughs> what I finally learned, and after reading Small is Beautiful by E.F. Schumacher and doing a number of other things and looking at folks, the place to start is right now <laughs> with whatever you do. And when, we, when, when that finally struck me, then I became equal to everybody that I was working with, now walking with. Kathy and I, Kevin and I, Todd and I, on and on, we, had, we, were, we were now equal because now we could do stuff, small stuff, together. And, when, and that, that meant a lot to me because now we were able to tell ordinary parents, as, as David had pointed out, folks next door, aunts and uncles, people who knew about the birth of this child into the neighborhood or the family, 
people who knew about someone near, nearby, but felt totally powerless about what to do, because after all, they're not the professional. I mean, this is really special. And we, you and those of you out there, and I, who got my master's degree in special education, PhD in rehab and all that stuff, I did a wonderful job. I mean, I, I have a pretty good speaking ability. And I could convince people, particularly if we were dealing with budgets, about how special this work was and how much we needed this extra money and how much no one else could do this except our people over here. And I needed money in my budget, right? Could you do that? You people, did somebody do that out here? You know? We need to do that to survive, unfortunately. The back side, the flip side of that is people listen to that and believe it. And ordinary folks say, uh-uh, I can't do that. That is too special. I can't interact with you. And what we're trying to do is say, well, there are certain aspects that are very special, very precise, needing highly sensitive competence. But just interacting, we've got to watch it. As David was very careful to say, let's watch what we do in terms of either destroying or building up natural community be between individuals. So starting small, just welcoming in, just doing the small things together, taking the rides, sending a card, making the phone call, all that stuff that ordinary folks can do. Going to the PP, in, in Connecticut we call them planning and placement team meetings in school. There used to be that, it's that place where parents, mostly the mom, gets in there with about five or six professionals for about 20 minutes and are told what they should do and sign off, right? And, that, and, and there should be a lot more interaction, but unfortunately, at least in Connecticut, I don't know what it's like in Rhode Island, that doesn't really happen that much. Well, there were a few parents that didn't want that to happen, and they came out crying a lot. We just sat together in our little circles of support saying, how can we help Mary? Mary Bradini and Pete get involved in school. And one of the things we found we could do very easily was have as many people at the PPT meeting as the PPT professionals would, would also have. Normally it's about five or six. Yeah, we have five or six people come. The big problem we had to get more chairs, but but we, we did that. And we went as friends, I, you know, and a couple of three of the neighbors. Did they have time? Sure. A couple, half an hour, no problem, an hour maybe. So they'd sit, knit, just sit there. And it was amazing what support that gave to Mary to have her friend there. Didn't know a thing about special ed, but knew about Pete. And I'll never forget one meeting when she was there, just sort of being there. And that's about the simplest and smallest thing that we have discovered to be the most powerful thing in the seven years we've been doing this. People who are simply there, being present, doing nothing, being a human being, not a human doing, just being present. We don't, we, we found out how important that is. Two or three of Mary's neighbors would come and be present. Sometimes they didn't say a thing. They signed the paper, friend, the battles would go on, stuff would go on, they leave. One time, we were, I happened to be there as well, and somebody was giving a report about Pete, written down, read off, and, and the parent, the, the, the neighbor said, I don't know Pete like that, and then said that. That's what she said. And that opened the mom's opportunity to say a few things to challenge the possible validity of some of the findings, which were going to cause Pete to be in, involved in a more segregated class. Little things like that, that caused mom to have the courage, folks to gather around, schools to rethink, and Pete's been involved in inclusive education in Mansfield, Connecticut for all of his elementary years, and today he begins, this, uh, this year he began middle school. It's those small things where groups of people coming together in circles of support helped one another. The next thing, which seems to be exactly the opposite of starting small, is changing systems. And that's where Kathy's experience comes into to play a lot more. It is, it is necessary 
sometimes to go after a particular regulation, a particular interpretation of regulations, a particular law, a particular system that caused, that is the block between a person and his or her vision. And special education laws and regulations and interpretations in individual towns and in the state of Connecticut is a block. So a number of parents have come together. We have the opportunity to say, well, you know, Mary, you and Norma and Marge down in Fairfield County and a couple of others have the same thing going on here. Maybe you should get together. And then we call the DD Council, because we're a DD, DD grantee. They call a few people together, and about three or four years ago, the Coalition for Inclusive Education began in Connecticut. And they've been chipping away and chipping away at the possibility <coughs> for kids to be educated within the context of normal classrooms, where they would be educated if they didn't have a disability. And that's what Amber's story is all about. And we get great, great inspiration from Amber. That's probably the place where circles of support is, is having the most long-term impact. Because if kids are in the same classrooms with other kids, I, as a person without a disability, my daughter is a person without a disability, is going to change their attitude because they're together. They're fighting it out. They're going through stuff. They're liking one another. They're hating one another. They're interacting with one another. Teachers are, are looking at things differently. We begin to talk about cooperative education instead of competitive education. There's a lot happening in those schools or those classrooms where Pete is allowed in. He's not going to compete at the sixth grade level with his particular disability and with Down syndrome and his mental retardation. But he should be with other 11 and 12 year olds, and he has been for the last four or five years. So that when he emerges at the other end, he's not parachuted into the community like some alien. He's been there all along, <laughs> and they know him as he is. He's not going to compete. And, and I've long since, I used to have a big battle, I used to, I used to be stopped right in my tracks when somebody would say to me, well, how is he going to compete in the sixth grade? And then I couldn't answer that. The answer is he's not going to compete in the sixth grade. Why should he? <laughs> you know, our whole, one of our issues that we're having within context of education and educational reform is to say, whoa, this may be a real good thing for all of us. And we're testing that out one classroom at a time, one kid at a time. The parents of the students in Pete's class, he's been there now since first grade, into, I guess, sixth grade, are the ones that say that their kids are learning far more than just reading, writing, arithmetic because Pete's there. You know, not always easy, not always wonderful. Yeah. The teacher needs supports. All sorts of stuff need to happen. But that somehow or other, that school district has figured it out and has worked with the parents, and that group of students is not going to be the same not going to be the same when they graduate from high school in about five or six years. That's the circle in your program there, the circles of support around education. Very, very important. Brings new life to parents of young kids. Wonderful to see kids involved in, in educational context. Let me uh, run on for a second. Those of you who know Beth Mount and know the Personal Futures Plan will recognize what this is about here. Kathy, let's see if I have the date in here. Kathy Ludlam um, created this, we, we created this sort of a, a array of uh, materials from Kathy Ludlam's life in uh, January or February of 1987. And the way we normally try to do things is we try to see 
what the current patterns of life for a person are, who the important people, who the important people are in, in her life, and what the images of the future, actually this was done on March 4th, 1987, I was looking for that date down there, what the images for the future that Kathy had for herself. This was done, as I indicated, on March 4th, 1987. Save that for a moment. Her life at the time that she wrote this revolved around home in Wethersfield, Connecticut, outside of Hartford. Uh, Mom did all the driving. Kathy had a little van, had a van. That was sort of the family car. Um, a lot to Newington Children's Hospital, because that was the only place that dealt with people with her severe disability, although at the time we met her, she was, uh, I think, 26. Uh, Central Connecticut <coughs> College was uh, the place she graduated, got her Bachelor of Arts degree from there. Did a lot of stuff in the mall. She had not, it says untapped Weathersfield resources, art, skill, evening school, etc. She went to a place called Car Camp Harkness, uh, which is a camp particularly oriented toward people with disabilities, uh, cerebral palsy, center outings, etc., and her church. So that was pretty much the context of her life. And let's see, work in the PNA office, the Protection and Advocacy Office, which was a main, a main part of her life at that time. The important people in her life, as we sort of do our thing in a, in a circle meeting, we kind of try to draw out important people in the life of the family or the individual. And as we did this, um, then she, she had a boyfriend named Chuck at the time, her mom, a Diane, a friend of hers who was an artist. She met her in school. A lot of people from Glastonbury, West Hartford, Newington, folks at the Protection Advocacy Office. And then some people, though not named, in the Writers Guild, the church, uh, and I don't know what WACH means. But she was, she had graduated and was a writer, uh, is a writer, and wanted to, to do that. So these were the important people. We didn't know what they would mean. What we asked her to do is choose among those people or anybody else that she might think of after we put that chart down to invite to what we call the first circle meeting. So as I said a few moments ago, she had to do the inviting. She had to determine those people who cared for her. And so her circle began. At that same time, we said, OK, what would you like your vision of the future to be like, Kathy? And what we tend to do, we've done this all along. It gets scary at times. But we put down exactly what they said without regard to quote unquote realism. Okay, we don't know where the money is, we don't know whether this person can do this thing, we have no idea of any of this stuff. Doesn't matter. This is their dream, this is their vision, etc. We'll begin there and walk toward that, and along the way we'll discover what can and can't be done, what obstacles are in the way, what opportunities there are for it. So when she put co-op housing down, we hadn't a clue. <laughs> I mean, we didn't know whether there was anything like this, and we, we, we saw the slides that David brought to us, but this is Winnipeg, Manitoba, man. She wants to live in Connecticut. So we put it all down, though. And she had conceived by the time we got to our point. We had called her and all that, so she had time to kind of think about this a little. She had thought of a housing cooperative where Chuck, her boyfriend, of course, other friends, there'd be people nearby feeling safe, right, but also being free respecting each other's space, in-home emergency support. She has a real difficulty. Uh, literally, if she coughs, she, well, she doesn't have a coughing mechanism in her body. So if she needs to cough, if someone isn't there to help her, literally push her stomach in and out, then she dies within 10 minutes. So that's, that's what no one could figure out in terms of one of the most distressful parts of her disability. She needed parking space, big deal around Hartford, <laughs> parking spaces. She thought of it as an artist community. Her friend Diane thought, helped her think about this concept. Artists are kind of very interesting people. They, take, they have hours all over the place. Some work at night, some work in the daytime, some don't work at all, etc. And so someone in the co-op, if it's an artist co-op, to her way of thinking, would always be there. Very important for her. 
Someone needs to always be present somewhere to be called upon if she needs to cough. So that was, that was her vision, help coughing if needed, a good support, et cetera, et cetera. She wanted to work, continue to work in the PA system at the time, but she wanted to go full time and have a health plan. And then in community life, she wanted much more about plays, concerts, get a master's degree, maybe speak Spanish, etc. She had, but her concentration was on her house at that time. So we began. on March 4th, 1987. The optimistic goal of the group gathered round was that we would celebrate Thanksgiving dinner 1988 in her new co-op. So, you know, we put all the planners in our midst, sort of put these little deadlines in there, and we said, that's what we're gonna do. It's a good, 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 good shot. Well, the reality is we will all have Thanksgiving dinner 1992, <coughs> Kathy's co-op, because it took her until February 3rd of this year to finally move in, five years. Now, why did it take five years? What happened during the course of that time and what a circle of support does in the context of working with other agencies, now we're not talking about substituting for, we're working with, but this is a different group of people. It may include agency people at times for certain reasons. First thing we had to do was discover what in heaven's name this thing called a co-op was in the context of United States law and in the context of Connecticut. And we discovered that in Connecticut, they were in fact co-ops, but they were all in the Spanish neighborhood of Hartford, all put together by a group called El Hogar del Futuro, so in fact, they existed, in fact, they could be created. That was good news. How to get them out of the Spanish sector of, of Hartford because this is not where Kathy would fit in. This was not her context. The other thing that we discovered was that none accepted people with disabilities yet. And as we asked a little bit more about that, not we, by we, I mean Kathy and a lot of her friends, I, I was facilitating and peripheral in this actually, they discovered that one of the criteria for co-op living within Connecticut was that you do sweat equity. And sweat equity means that you spend time working on the place in lieu of money. So you sweat at $5 an hour, the way they figure it out, and for two or 300 hours, that equals X amount of money that you would normally just put in, in the pocket. And so they figured, Poorer people, people for whom these co-ops were being developed in the first place, could sort of come up with their labor easier than to come up with dollars. So they had this whole sweat equity component, and how could a person like Kathy ever do sweat equity? Or anybody with a pretty intense physical disability. And it was not ever, and we, we came back scratching our heads and saying, oh, geez, how, how would that happen? And here we are, sitting in the context of a circle of support. And someone in the circle said, hey, does Kathy have to do it? Or could other people do it in her behalf? Well, we rushed back and asked that question, and the answer is, yeah, someone could do it in her behalf. And that opened the doors. <laughs> uh, what needed to happen, though, and one of the reasons for a long-term struggle was that systems change. Remember that systems change thing? Needed to occur. The housing department of the state of Connecticut couldn't figure this out. They had plans stuck in stone, boom, this is the way you do them, that didn't include accessibility. And, but if Kathy wanted to have a housing cooperative just for people with disabilities, we could do that pretty fast. And she said, no, 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 uh -uh, honey, that's not what I have in mind. <laughs> so two to three years more were tacked on to the time frame because we had to change the housing department system. Actually had to create another agency another DD called Co-op co co Initiatives. And we met this lady by way of a lot of circuitous route from up in Springfield that knew something about this. And Sarah Page helped Kathy and is helping literally hundreds of people with physical disabilities get into co-ops throughout Connecticut now. It took that long also because they wanted to find the right place, the right town. They, they, they needed to have a context where it was 
a, a right piece of property close to town, Main Street, able to be reasonably accessible for Kathy to kind of buzz her electric wheelchair that she deals in, all that sort of stuff. So finally, after a lot of fits and starts and all that, they discovered a piece of property in Manchester, Connecticut. And the construction went on last year, uh, at, at this time and in the summer. And people began to move in in December of 1991. And Kathy was the last one to move in in, in February 3rd of 1992. So her dream of living in a housing block was not quite the way it is there. Uh, there were 16 units, as David said, four of which are totally accessible, built like ranch-style homes, 12 units of which are built like townhouses, all carefully, carefully designed, which is another reason it took time, because we had to, they had to change the, they had to get approvals all along the way from the housing department to do these strange things like move the kitchen so they looked out the window, have a parking lot that was separate, not in front of each unit, so that people actually had to get out of their cars and walk, you know, greet, not just go into their parking garage and not even see another person. All of these things that they tried to do to create community, to create a context in which Kathy and other people with disabilities could feel safe and free. And as it turns out, Kathy was elected president of this cooperative, the first go round, um, and um, has been, has had something to say. And I need to share with you I guess that's the end of my remarks at this point. Some of the things that she has to say here, because one of the things that I, that, that every time we speak about this, we have so short a time normally, that we tend to tend to hit the positive sides of all this, and I have a, I'm sure there are people saying, oh yeah, great George, this is great, yeah, Kathy's, but what about Amy that I'm thinking about, you know, and what about, what about we need to talk about Amy or Sarah or Philip or George or whoever it is that you're talking and thinking about there that, that this may, this idea of individualization may not work. Maybe we have some time tomorrow with some individual families, I guess. Let's talk a little bit about the, the, the dark side of this. And one of the things that we've learned, dark not in the sense that it's something to be avoided, but dark in the sense that this is ordinary life that you and I have experienced. And we tend to call what we're doing, and when we talk to Kathy and other people, we realize this. We tend to talk about what we're doing as a journey, and the fact that we're on this walk together, and that we make a commitment for a certain amount of time, or maybe for a lifetime, right? And that it has its positive, joyful, wonderful points, and it has its very, very sad, depressing, frustrating points, like your life, like my life, right? And the point that we're trying to make is, and that John McKnight shared with us, is that we're talking about community here, which is pretty messy. Think about the Thanksgiving table each of you are going to get around and that I'm going to get around in about a month. That's a pretty messy place, <laughs> you know? Not everybody's wonderfulness and light around this family table, you know? But it's family, it's the thing we celebrate. It's, you know, we've had, we have pictures, this is perfection, right? It's not perfection. It's ordinary stuff. You know, when somebody's had a tough time, somebody has a good time, we celebrate somebody, we argue with somebody else. That's family, that's community, that's ordinary stuff. And what we're saying is that this is what we're talking about for people with disabilities. Unfortunately, many of us, including me, try to create these perfect, foolproof, absolutely can't miss, programs that must get done in three months or else we don't get funded. Not possible. <laughs> not, not real. This is not what, you know, I, that when we decide to work on, we got to work on the kind, if we're talking about living in the community, it's your community and my community, not some perfect community someplace. We work together to create a more perfect place, but we know that it's not always going to be. Let me read from you. I was handed this as I walked out of my office last night to come here. This is the latest issue of the Communitas Communicator. Uh, Communitas was an organization, as David mentioned, that we started in 1988 because we began to meet through David up in Canada, through John McKnight and his efforts, and through a lot of people, people around the country, around Canada, 
And right now, at this moment, we have guests from England that we're hosting in Manchester uh, who are working on circles of support in Bristol, England, particularly. We're beginning to meet people around. We had to figure out a way of continuing to communicate and network. So Communitas started. So this is the newsletter of Communitas. It's edited by Kathy Ludlam because her gift and capacity is writing. And she writes in here her latest thing. I'm going to read. I can't read the whole thing. It's too long. But I want to read certain segments and then leave you with this. And to say that circles of support you know, can be a kind of a buzzword, can be misused entirely. Look at this as just the way you, you have circles of support. You probably had breakfast with two or three friends this morning. I don't know. Maybe you gather together once a week with a bunch of people. Some people have prayer groups. I have a couple of groups that I gather with one on Monday, Monday mornings, three or four guys and myself. That's a circle of support to me. We all have circles of support. We just happen to have to call them this for some reason and re retool ourselves that these things are things that should happen to people with disabilities. We all do this. Last fall, I wrote a story for the communicator about my upcoming move into a housing cooperative. The June. I mean, let me read this. The title is Reaching Your Dream is Only Half the Battle. Reaching Your Dream is Only Half the Battle. So last fall, I wrote a story for the communicator about my upcoming move into a housing cooperative. The journey, which had taken five years, was shared with a group of friends who became my circle of support. Many times it looked as though it would be impossible to include me in a co-op. But my, but my other alternative was a nursing home, and none of us were willing to settle for that. On February 3rd, after endless delays and disappointments, my dream came true as I moved into Common Thread Housing Cooperative in Manchester, Connecticut. In this article, I want to include the many victories of this year, being elected president of our 16 family complex, learning to juggle cooking, cleaning, and related household tasks, increasing my ability to stay by myself, surviving a cold, not ever a sure thing. Very big perfect and continuing to get the support I need from my circle members, roommates, and assistants, neighbors, and friends. I also want to mention what my mother is doing these days, how she bought a little red car and for the first time in 29 years truly has a life of her own. But that is only half the story. To say that everything is wonderful now would be to deny the personal trauma involved in any transition and the inevitable change a dream undergoes as it becomes a reality. During the first few weeks, people kept saying, your dream has come true. You must be so excited. Actually, I alternated between being numb and being terrified. Everything was so different, and I had so many new responsibilities. Most of the things which were familiar to me were still in boxes, and I was constantly in need of things I didn't yet have, a plunger, a sharp knife, scotch tape. I was too overwhelmed to think about buying curtains or hanging pictures, so I left the walls bare and relied on white, sh relied on white shades that came with the windows. I'm going to just do the headings of our next paragraph. There were problems inherent in moving into a brand new building, things that weren't right. In addition to the natural stress of the situation, there were more practical concerns. The support system my circle and I had designed called for me to share my three-bedroom unit with two living assistants. Lisa and I moved in hoping that we would find our third person soon. In the meantime, we got up at 5 a.m., etc. We survived with the help of friends and part-time people, but everyone involved experienced a certain amount of exhaustion and frustration. It was much harder for me to manage time effectively with my assistants and get everything done than she had imagined. Beyond the personal struggles, our whole co-op was going through its own growing pains. We all moved in during the same two-week period. And there were 16 different families and expectations and tempers flared, etc. as she notes in here. One of the hardest things to accept is that community has a negative aspect as well as, as the positive ones we always talk about. It is where all people belong, and it is worth fighting to see people included, but that does not mean it is always pleasant. Along with the spontaneity, the naturalness of relationships, the fun, the strength, and the creativity, there's also the tendency to form cliques, to make judgments, to start rumors, to get on one another's, to get in one another's way, to make enemies as well as to make friends. People have had personal struggles which have affected everyone in the co-op. 
There are many children living here, and it's sometimes difficult to supervise them adequately. Pets, parking, and the use of community rooms have also caused contention among us. This shouldn't surprise those of us who had the vision, but somehow it does. There is a sadness associated with the loss of the perfect little neighborhood which existed only in our minds. That is not to say we could have or would have done anything differently. Instead, it is to acknowledge the difference between a dream and a reality. And I am perhaps overstating the problems. Those of us who live here have reached our dreams in various ways. Some of us came to the co-op seeking safety. I have called on my neighbors to say that I needed assistance with breathing, and they have rushed right over. Other members wanted a secure environment in which to raise their children. They came here to, to escape substandard housing, drugs, or crime. They too have found what they were looking for. We all watch each other's homes, cars, and kids, and anyone who would harm one of us would have to contend with all of us. Some came in search of a true neighborhood. In spite of the problems, people do hang out together in the courtyard and eat dinner in one another's homes. We have been able to rely on one another for rides, for car repairs, for help in carrying things that encompass other situations. There have been joint shopping trips. We held an Easter egg hunt for the children, worked together to plan the dedication of our co-op, and our 4th of July, most of us went to the same fireworks display. Things have improved greatly in the last six months, and the more we iron out the bugs, the better it will be. I am increasingly happy to be living here. As I get settled, I become more able to interact with the members of the co-op and be involved in the town of Manchester. It's getting easier to juggle the responsibilities of my support system, house, and job. My circle is encouraging me to make time for myself. Now there's a thought, as she puts in parentheses. I am beginning to hang pictures on my walls and to consider painting parts of my unit something other than white. Best of all, my dread of ending up in a nursing home recedes further and further into the background as that possibility becomes more remote. Life is hard sometimes, but we are coping. My, my dream was not that my life be made easy or perfect, but that my ability to live the way I want to live remain intact into the future. This is what has happened and what is really worth getting excited about. I want to thank you very much for that.